good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure and privilege to welcome Lady Valerie Cox to Edgware United Synagogue this evening. Throughout her political career, she has been a staunch supporter of our community and of, and of the State of Israel, and was director of the Labour Friends of Israel for many years. She was the founder of the trade union Friends of Israel, co-founder of the Pro-Israel Peers Group, and an active Labour Friends of Israel organiser and fundraiser during Prime Minister Will Harold Wilson's leadership of the party. She remained a friend of his until his death in 1995, and thereafter continued as a friend of Mary Wilson. In 1979, she married the moderate Labour politician My Michael Cox, who was Labour's chief whip from 1976 to 1985. You may like to know that almost like the whip's job today, he was responsible from 1976 to 1979 of ensuring government majorities for a minority government. He was given a peerage in 1987. Valerie and Michael would invite Harold and Mary to Friday night dinners at their home, at which they discussed Israeli politics and bilateral relations. Lady Cox remains active in politics to this day. You may have read her forthright comments on John Landsman, the pro-Corbyn Momentum Chief. She also clashed with, with Gerald Kaufman over a number of years. She does not confine her political life solely to our community and fights injustice elsewhere. I attended a meeting organized by her in Parliament last September on the persecution of minorities at the hands of tyrannical regimes and militant groups in the Middle East with speakers of the Yazidi, Druze, Jewish and Assyrian Christian communities. Our speaker has said, Harold Wilson would not have kept so amazingly silent as everyone is keeping. Why do more Christians not realize that the only place where fellow Christians are safe in the Middle East is Israel? How is it possible that every British politician isn't screaming about it? I think we are set for a memorable evening comparing and contrasting the heady days of the 60s and 70s with the current political position. Please welcome Lady Valerie Cox. Good evening, everybody. It's a very great pleasure to be here, and I thank Spencer, your chairman, for inviting me. The only thing I couldn't remember was, I just asked him where we met, because I, I couldn't remember if his name was Spencer Nathan or Nathan Spencer. But anyway, it's lovely to be here. And I also thank John Rivkin very much for picking me up and bringing me here and his wife for making a lovely supper this evening. When you're working for Israel, as you know perfectly well, it can be very dangerous. You can have a lot of aggravation. You meet all the horrible people, all the anti-Semites, and it's really, really something quite horrible. Um, there have been times when I went to a trade union meeting and the union executive said, you'd better leave before the end and don't take, a, don't take the bus. There are people waiting at the, the bus or the station to get to you and beat you up and just take a taxi to the next station and go home. And there have been many, many such occasions and it's been pretty tiring and horrible. One wouldn't believe it in the middle of a democracy of England. But I've also had great joy and great honor too. Imagine, I, I have been great friends with Shimon Peres, with Itzhak Rabin, Moshe Dayan, Chaim Barlev, and other even. Shimon Peres and many other members of the Knesset came to my daughter's wedding and uh, the only annoying thing there was my first husband told everyone that he came to <laughs> because they, he knew him and he'd never ever met my first husband. I was try tr that was really annoying to me, I must admit. There were so many different stories with the leaders of, the, of Israel. I, so, I could tell you so many stories. One story, Shimon Peres, I had to go and pick him up at the airport in London. And when I got to the airport, Oh, before I got to the airport, I thought, I'm going to pick up Shimon, take him to a meeting, and then to three other meetings. When is he going to be able to eat anything? And then I thought, I make very good chopped liver. I make the best chopped liver that anyone does. So I made chopped liver sandwiches, and I got to the airport. And when I was at the airport in the VIP lounge, Madame Shimon Weil was there. And I had always heard that she's a great friend of Shimon Peres. So I went over to her and said to Madame Weil, I don't know if I can interrupt you, but 
I've just come to pick up Shimon Peres and I'm picking him up from the plane and bring him here. So she said, oh, you've no idea what a help this is to me. It's too marvelous. We've been trying to find each other for days. So I'll wait here. So I put the, the chopped liver sandwiches on the table. I went to the plane to pick up Shimon Peres. And when he came down from the plane, I said, I hope I did the right thing. Madam Bail is sitting in the, in the VIP lounge, and I told her, you're coming, and she's waiting to see you. So he said, this is too marvelous. I've been looking for her for days. You don't know what a good turn you've done me. How wonderful. But I must tell you, I must speak to her privately. And would you mind going to sit somewhere else? No, of course not. So Shimon Peres came in, and he sat down, and to my utter joy, the two of them were eating my chopped liver sandwiches, and I was so proud. And then the manager of the airport came in, and he came over to Shimon Peres and said, oh, Mr. Peres, we're so honored you're here, and Madame Weil, how wonderful. And Shimon Peres said, no, we're very happy to be here, and particularly as you did this wonderful thing, knowing I'm coming to make chopped liver sandwiches. I don't know how. You knew that I liked chopped liver sandwich, and this was the best chopped liver I've ever tasted. Well, I thought my cup is running over, and then the airport manager staggered away and held onto the chair and called one of his assistants over, and he said, oh my God, where did the chopped liver sandwiches come from if we poisoned Shimon Peres and Madame Weil, it'll be the end of our careers, or the end of everything, it'll be too terrible. And why I didn't say I made the chopped liver sandwiches, but I didn't. I thought it sounded a bit mumsy, and I wouldn't mention it. Anyway, it ended up with really Shimon Peres going on and on about the chopped liver sandwiches, how good they are, and the airport manager nearly fainting all over the place. And, sent, and I left, and I've always felt guilty about it. I left with them all screaming and running around looking to where the chopped liver sandwiches came from. And I once told Shimon the story, and he thought it was ter terribly, terribly funny. Itzhak Rabin came to a dinner once, which I organized in the House of Commons, and he was uh, sitting at the top table, as, as I was, and Ian Mercado was the chairman at the time, and, she, and um, Harold Wilson was on the table, and they were all drinking a phenomenal amount. And Itzik Rabin sent me a note, which I had for years, and now I've lost it. I've searched the house, and the note said, hurry up with the dinner, or they'll all be under the table except you and me. But they were all drinking so much. The whole top table was completely completely uh, drunk. You know, I had another dinner. It, it's terrible that I lost this note from Shimon Perez. I would have loved to keep it. Moshe Diane came to a dinner in London, which I organized when I was running Labour Friends of Israel. And it was a lovely hotel in Knightsbridge. And we had an enormous table with chicken, not chicken, with fish and cheese and fruit and nuts. And it was the most marvelous table and you were to help yourself. So Moshe Dayan came over to me and said, I don't eat fish, I want chicken. I said, chicken, you know, where am I going to get chicken now? So he said, well, I want chicken. I'm not speaking if I can't get anything to eat. So then Ian Mercado and my husband were standing there and they heard him. So Ian Mercado said to me, it's a, what a chutzpah to ask you to get chicken now. Where are you supposed to get chicken? And we're putting on the whole thing for Israel. And what a chutzpah some of them have. So I said, yes, but it doesn't matter. So he said, listen, I'm telling you categorically, if you go and get chicken for him, I know you, you'll think you have to get chicken. If you go and get chicken for him, you're fired. And then my husband said, never mind fired. If you dare to go and get chicken for him, you're divorced. <laughs> so <laughs> they wandered away. And I went behind the table on my hands and knees and crept out and went to a restaurant just nearby. And I said, it doesn't matter what it costs, give me a piece of chicken. And they gave me a piece of chicken at some exorbitant cost. And I went back in cra crawling behind the table and there was Ian Mercado and my husband standing there. So Ian Mercado said to me, I knew you'd go and get him chicken, you're fired. And my husband said, on top of which you're divorced. And I suddenly lost my temper and I I said, listen, Moshe Dayan fought his way to the Western Wall. He lost his eye. He saw all his friends be killed, all those, all those uh, tanks and lorries at the side of the road in, on the road to Jerusalem. And if he wanted a piece of chicken, there would be nothing to stop me from, from getting it for him. And I could tell you 
many more stories of so many dinners and so many events. And it's all wonderful memories. I can't believe how lucky I've been in my life. I was born in Brick Lane in, in the East End. I'm a real Cockney. And um, how, how lucky I've been to know these people and to be closely friendly with them. And it's, it has really been a, an enormous honor and an enormous joy to me. Oh, mind you, there were very wonderful people here. Harold Wilson was our president for many years until he became sick. As our chairman said, Mary and I were friends. I found her when she was 102 on the floor. I had a key to her flat and I found her unconscious on the floor and called an ambulance and took her to the hospital. George Thomas, Viscount Tony Pandy, was a great friend and totally devoted to Israel. He always said Israel was the country he loved most after his own, which was Wales. And Lord Glenamara, who had been Ted Short and the deputy prime minister of the country, uh, was uh, the deputy president. And Ian Mercado was the most left-wing member of parliament and, to and the president, the chairman of Labour Friends of Israel. But these people were a joy to work with and uh, I really had great, great pleasure in working with them. And look at the difference now. These were all the leaders of the Labour Party. On the other hand, I went to a, to a memorial service a few weeks ago, and suddenly everybody, all the Labour people, all the politicians, Betty Boothroyd and lots of others, came over to me and made the biggest fuss of me. Now, when Mike was alive, everybody was nice to me and interested in me, but Mike's been dead 18 years now, and most of them couldn't care less if they see me or not, of course. You know, uh, nothing is forgotten so quickly as an old woman. But this time, they all came over to me and made such a fuss of me, and I said, why am I so suddenly popular again? And everybody said, because we were so thrilled with the letters you wrote to the Jewish Chronicle. So I said, really, you read the Jewish Chronicle? And they said, no. Dozens and dozens of Jewish people had sent my letters to them. Once, Mike, when he first went into the Lords, you always go into the Lords if you've been a um, uh, chief whip in government. So we knew Mike was going into the Lords. I always told him that was the main reason I married him anyway. But the, Mike said, came home one day, and he said, the BBC called and said, would I like to be deputy chairman of the BBC? So I said, that's marvelous, lovely, I'd be pleased about that. So he said, no, but I have to talk to you. You have to promise not to call the BBC complaining about their reporting. You have to promise me. So I said, okay. So he said, it doesn't sound like you. So I said, well, I will promise. So he said, why? I said, well, it would be nice invitations. And he said, invitations, you don't know where to go first now. So I, anyway, I'd like all those invitations. I'd like you to be the deputy chairman of the BBC. So he took the job, and it was quite well paid, and it was quite nice invitation. But the first day he was working there, he came home, and he said, I'm really annoyed. You, you promised me you wouldn't phone them. And they said, the first day I was there, you called eight times today. Have you got a, an explanation for it? So I said, yes, I have a perfect explanation. What's your explanation? I said, I lied to you. So he said, yes, that's true. You lied. It's absolutely true. And I said, and you knew perfectly well I was lying. There was no way I would give up the opportunity. And there's no, can you hear me? Hello? Is that good? Yeah. So I said there was no way I'd give up the opportunity of you being the deputy chairman. The BBC are such liars that it's hard to imagine that people can be such liars knowing they're lying. You know, the BBC would say things like, Gaza is surrounded, the poor people in, in the Gaza Strip can't get in and out, the Israelis have got them surrounded, they can't get anything, that's anything in and out. And I would call them and say, why are you such liars? There's no way Israel can can surround the Gaza Strip. There's a border with Egypt. It's totally impossible physically for Israel to surround the Gaza Strip. Ah, yes, but the, Egypt won't let them in and out. Ah, that's fine. If you want to say Egypt and Israel have got them surrounded, 
that you can say, but you can't say Israel is able to, to uh, surround them. It's just a complete and utter lie. Recently, over 300 Christians were killed in Sri Lanka, and the BBC and the LBC and many government figures reported this because it was impossible to ignore the situation. And you know how they reported it? They said there was a terrible attack on the Easter worshippers. So I called the BBC and the LBC. What do you mean, what are, ter what are Easter worshippers? Oh, you know perfectly well what it is. You know it means Christians. So no, I don't mean that. I thought it meant people who worship people who worship Easter. No, no, it means Christians. Well, if it means Christians, why not say there was an attack on Christians and you, they killed 300 Christians? I've never heard the phrase, the phrase Easter worshippers, and I think it's simply disgusting that we can't get any Christian voices to speak up for their fellow Christians, even if they're crucified. But when they crucify them now, they're very merciful. They no longer nail them to crosses. They just tie them to the crosses and they put their eyes out with a spear and they're left hanging there till they die with no hope of anyone helping them. I used to have photographs of the people on the, on the crosses, but I don't bring them anymore because people can't sleep for a week if they've actually seen those photographs. We're always told that the second biggest press corps in the world is sent to Israel. Well, it's very strange they don't pick up any of the stories about what's going on in the Middle East. That all the biggest press, second biggest press corps in the world never seem to find out what's happening to Christians and all the other majority, minority religions in the Middle East. Our chairman mentioned that last September I organized a meeting in the House of Commons all about the religions in the Middle East being killed by Muslims. And it is really about Israel all the time. I want the people to know what's going on in the Middle East. And it's very good to attack other things that are going on, not necessarily directly connected with Israel. More than 200 nations have been wiped from the map in the Middle East, even Christians crucified. But why? There's a deafening silence about it. At the meeting uh, last September, run by the Henry Jackson Society, 18 different religions came. Some I had no idea they were still alive, that there was still, a, did you know there were Assyrians still in the Middle East being, being murdered by the Muslims? 18 religions, all complaining and all with, pro, with proof that they're being killed by the Muslims in the Middle East. This meeting was very successful and there was nothing in the papers, nothing on television and nothing in the radio. I'm trying again to have another meeting about it. I think it's our best propaganda exercise, quite apart from the fact that it's such a terrible shame on these people and we ought, in any case, to try and help them. And I'm trying again with Lynn Julius, who is, is a Jewish woman who speaks up for Israel, it's a wonderful woman, and some people from B'nai B'rith. I think it's terribly important that we speak up for, the, for all these minority groups. When, Israel, when my sister and I were in Israel last time, the police chief in Sidorot asked us to come and see what's going on in the Gaza Strip. And we went down to Sidorot, and the police chief took us up to the top of the hill, looking down on Gaza. And we looked down on Gaza, and there were lots of people driving around, and lots of lights on. And from the top of the hill, I'm sure there's problem, terrible problems there, but from the top of the hill, it looked quite a prosperous place with lots of lights on and lots of cars driving around. And then we turned on the radio, and the BBC said the poor people in the Gaza Strip were sitting in the dark. They had no oil for their lights, for their lamps. They were completely in the dark, and they couldn't move, and they were suffering terribly. And uh, I called the BBC. I said, what are you talking about? I'm sitting on, top, on the hill looking down into Gaza and all the lights are on. You're just lying through your teeth. And they said, no, well, they're very sorry. But th when the reporters called in the report an hour ago, they were sitting in the dark. They had no oil for the lamps at all. So I said, well, an hour ago, it was bright sunlight here. The sun goes down very quickly. And, and are you saying that the Arabs have got no oil? 
all the things I've heard the lies the BBC have told before, I've never before heard that they've got no oil. They can't get a little oil for their lamps, but they can build tunnels. Did you read in this week's Chronicle what a tunnel they built now? It was a tunnel that was deep into the ground, 22 stories high. How many hundreds of tons of concrete does it need? But they couldn't get a little bit of oil through the passage or through the tunnels. It was simply too terrible for words. In the Christmas before last, Lord Weidenfeld had a whole, whole page in the Times. And it said Lord Weidenfeld had saved a 100 Christian families for, from Iran and Iraq. And uh, the 100 families meant 500 people had been saved. He took them, he couldn't get them into England. I don't know why they wouldn't let these people into England, but they wouldn't. And the only place he could get them into was Poland. Now, these, most of these people had never heard of Poland. They didn't want to go to Poland, but it was better than being crucified in Iraq. And he put them in Poland. He got little flats for them and he gave them some money to start off with and help them to get started in life. And, you know, he got the hundreds of letters from people saying what a disgusting uh, racist he was. Then why did he save Christians? Why didn't he save Muslims or the first people who came along? So anyone who'd put a an address on the letter, there weren't many, he wrote back to say, you save who you like, you tell me who you've saved. In the meantime, I've saved 500 people. If anybody wants to go and speak or find out what's happening, the best book to learn what is happening to Christians is Rabbi Lord Sachs' book, Not in God's Name. Have any of you read it? It's, a, it's brilliant. And it, in the first quarter of the book, it tells all the stories of what's happening to Christians in the Middle East. I was at a dinner a few weeks ago, and there was a bishop there. And I said to him, I can't believe that no Christians are demonstrating or speaking up to save their fellow Christians. And he said, oh, it wouldn't be right to cause bad feeling between Muslims and Christians. I said, if you think reporting what's happening is causing bad feeling and not the people who are murdering causing bad feelings, then there's no hope for any of us, really. Lord Sachs's book it was simply brilliant, and I recommend that everyone should read it. Nobody has dared to contest one word he said. Nobody has said publicly that this is a lie. But how is it possible that the whole Christian world has not made one demonstration outside an Arab embassy? The only embassy they can demonstrate about, against is the Israeli embassy. It's simply a most mad world. There's another person, I mentioned her before, Lynn Julius, and she speaks for the Jews, and her book is uprooted, and that's another must to learn what has happened to the Jews in the Middle East. Um, we, at the meeting, we had Leila Furman, who's speaking for the Yazidis. We had Lord Ashton and Lord Hilton at a meeting. Uh, the Yazidis called and invited me to a meeting that the Yazidis arranged. Amir Knifes come to do a meeting at JW3 last week, and here's the report on, on uh, in the Jewish Chronicles, a half a page report about it, and I called him and said we had a half a page in the Jewish Chronicle, and he was very pleased about it, and it's worth reading what's going on to these minority groups. Um, we had lots of other groups, the Kurds, and even my whole porter is a Kurd, and he came to the meeting, and now he's my greatest fan, and uh, will do anything for me, even change the light bulbs or anything else that he's not supposed to do. But with all of this, we may go to lots of meetings and all the Jewish groups tell each other how clever we are and how successful we are. And one has to say that the Jewish groups make a lot of money fundraising. The Jews seem to be good at fundraising. But the political work is absolutely zero. It's no use to man or beast. It is too terrible what's going on politically in this country, and we've got to learn to speak up for ourselves. The, I once, I told um, John Rifkin, once I was working for Labour Friends of Israel, and I gave out a paper about South Africa. Everyone was accusing Israel of doing deals, doing business with South Africa. 
And they certainly did do business with South Africa. And I gave out a paper saying, it is true Israel does business with South Africa, but South Africa can manage very well without anything Israel has got. The one thing is South Africa hasn't got is oil. And they're not getting the oil from the Israelis, they're getting the oil from the Arabs. And I was very pleased with that paper, and lots of people came over to me and said that was a very good paper, and they hadn't thought about that, and of course it's true, they're getting the oil from the Arabs. And then the next day in my office, I had a phone call, and I had one sentence. This is the IRA speaking. If you give out one paper about that subject ever again, the next 25 people we kill will be Jews. So I never gave out one of those papers again. I wasn't going to risk 25 Jews getting killed. I have no idea if it was the IRA. I shouldn't think so. I think it was a bluff. But if you are murderers and you threaten people with murder, it's quite hard to answer that. But I think we, get, we have to get tougher here. There's too many Jewish enemies here. I was at a very nice dinner party a few weeks ago, and all the people at the table were rich, upper-class Jews, and they were all talking badly about Israel. And I think we should put a stop to it and tell them what we think of it. I think all the Jewish people have to be ambassadors. Jonathan Hoffman asked me to come to a demonstration outside Labour Party headquarters a few months ago. And I went there, and there were 25 lovely people, and we were demonstrating. And then there were 200 anti-Israel Jews demonstrating there. You can die of shame, and we shouldn't permit it, and we shouldn't put up with it, in my opinion. I think people should write to the newspapers, especially local newspapers, and speak to Christian groups, and call the call-in programs. We sit, I sit there listening to LBC every morning, and most of the time it's insulting Israel, that Israel is too terrible and too wicked and the poor Palestinians, and we should try at least, speak up for ourselves, stand up for ourselves, and put a stop to all of that. So thank you very much for listening. I hope you don't think I'm too much of a hard person, but I am on this subject. I feel bitterly and deeply about it. And I think if everybody in this room would get two of their family to write letters and call in program, we've got, anyway, we've got to try, and I beg of you to do so. George Brown was married yeah. to a Jewish lady called yeah. Sophie, but it didn't prevent him from having views about Israel that were very different to Harold Wilson. Did you ever encounter George Brown and, and remonstrate with him? Yes, George Brown was a real enemy of Israel, and there was nothing you could do to change his mind on any subject. But we've got, late, we've got bigger problems now. George Brown was just speaking out. These people make no mistake about it. They, they can't even say the word Israel without Israel ugh, with such a hatred. If they could get away with being Hitler, they would. And I think George Brown was mostly just talking about, not that it was good, the George Brown, and not that I understood why his wife put up with it, but um, it, we've got much more problems than worrying about George Brown now. Much more immediate problems. Can I just ask you a supplementary? I didn't realize it was normal. Manny Shinwell, did you ever encounter him? Because he sat yes. in the same cabinet. Yes, I went to Manny Shinwell's 100th birthday party, and he was quite a, a charmer. And he said he'd never been that interested in Israel before, but in the end he did. He did speak up for Israel in the last few years. And I was at the 100th birthday party, and I always remember he said, if I'd known how long I was going to live, I would have taken better care of myself. <laughs> um, one a very prominent Labour politician, Viscount Stansgate, Tony Wedgwood Ben. I can't it, Sorry. Viscount Stansgate, Tony Wedgwood Ben, or whatever you want to call him, uh, was extremely pro-Israel uh, pro in the 1940s. Tony Ben used to be very pro-Israel. And my husband and I were at a meeting once when the whole party was shouting and screaming, Israel is disgusting. And Mike said, look at Tony Ben's face. Mike hated Tony Ben. He had the next constituency to him in Bristol. And 
uh, Tony, he said, look at Tony Benn's face. He'll never speak up for Israel again, watch. And when Tony Benn saw how popular it was to be anti-Israel, he changed from that day onwards and never said a pro-Israel word anymore. Tony Benn was very clever and charismatic, but he was the stingiest person we ever met. He couldn't simply bear to spend a penny, even if he went into the House of Commons with his wife, who was a very rich woman, they would order one Coca-Cola between them, and all that sort of thing. And every time there was an election, the MP would make a party for all his constituents and all the people who worked for him. And we used to make a lovely party. I always felt that as a Jewish wife, I had to make a really nice party for everybody. But Tony Benn, would charge people to go into the meeting and, and everyone had to buy their own drinks. He was the most incredibly stingy man I ever met in my life. But uh, he certainly was charismatic. Even, even today, outside the House of Commons, there were groups of people saying, Tony Benn said this and that and the other, all people demonstrating. Lady Cox, one of the questions which is raised is, if you are a traditional Labour supporter, or Labour MP, when is the time to come to say we can no longer belong to the party which is unrecognizable? Is it still right to stay and fight from within or has it gone far beyond that in your view? Well, my decision was made some months ago when I resigned. But, but everybody must do what they think best. There's a wonderful woman running uh, Labour Friends of Israel now. His, her name is John, Joan Ryan and she's really marvelous. And um, she couldn't, she's not Jewish, but she left the Labour Party now. Although she's still running Labour Friends of Israel, I don't know how long they'll, they'll let her go on doing it. But um, everyone must do what they think best. Some people say it's best to fight within. I mean, people like Louise Elman have not left the party, and she's too marvelous for words. But the fact is that I wouldn't be associated with those people for anything in the world. In the last analysis, everyone must do what they, what they think best. I thought you might like to know that in the last hour or so, uh, the online copy, um, copy of the Jewish Chronicle has reported Luciana Berger's local Labour Party says anti-Semitism claims are largely unfounded. Liverpool Waver Tree CLP maintains Jew hate is not an issue, despite Miss Berger's call, uh, uh, calling it institutionally anti-Semitic when she quit. Um, there's many people in the Labour Party who simply won't recognise um, that um, anti-Semitism exists and it has been suggested that we should call it anti-Jewish racism rather than anti-Semitism. Well, of course it's racism, but if somebody's anti-Israel and they don't want to say how the lovely Arab states are behaving, with all the Christian friends that I know, uh, uh, all the groups who work politically all say that the only place Christians are safe in the Middle East is in Israel, and the only place Kurds are safe in the Middle East is, is in Israel. And um, when I wrote to the Jewish Chronicle, I wrote that they're not only anti-Semitic, they're anti-Christian and they're anti-gay as well. They've never spoken up for gay rights in Gaza, where all the people were, all the gay people were thrown off the tallest buildings. And they never speak up. They never speak up for anybody, only against Israel. It, it is really, it is really disgusting. But I never would have believed, never would have believed that the Christian world would keep so quiet about what's happening to Christians now. And I think we should talk as much about it as possible. A, we might save a few Christians, and B. It, it's good public relations for Israel. The only place the Christians are safe in the Middle East is in Israel. They said on the, the police said on the radio this week that there were 19 attacks being organized in England, terrorist attacks, and 14 were from Muslim groups and five were from very right wing groups. So you can't, you can't say more than that. If 15 groups were ready, ready to attack, 14 groups were ready to attack us in England, what can you say more than that? But not one demonstration against one Arab embassy. So how is it possible to believe it? You said that um, we should all support Israel. Um, I would like to try and draw a distinction 
between my view, which is I absolutely agree with the right of the state of Israel to exist, but I also agree that it is right to disagree with the policies of the government of the state of Israel. And these are two quite distinct matters. You could be totally pro the existence of the state of Israel, but object to the policies of the government of that day. If you want to object to the policies, of course you certainly can, but you have to put everything in the context of the area where you are. If you object to what the, Arab, the worst thing that any Arab Israeli government has ever done is heaven on earth compared to what the Arab states are doing all around them. So if you say, I don't agree with this policy of the Israeli government, not that I disagree with them at all. I've become more and more of the opinion that the stronger they are, the, the more safe they are, which is why the people vote for him, obviously, because they also feel that it's very dangerous there. It's easy to live here in comfort and, and uh, disagree with what the uh, Israelis are doing, but anything the Israelis are doing is heaven on earth compared to what the Arabs are doing. So as long as you say that at the same time, you, of course, have every right to criticize Whatever you want. They won't say one word about all the gay people being thrown off the tallest buildings in Gaza. There was just a gay parade in Israel. And I've, I've been to Arab groups and they're terribly demonstrating against Israel. They won't let the gay parade go through the Mir Sharim. And you say to them, what are you talking about? In the Arab states, they won't have a gay parade anywhere. So what do you, no, no, Israel is disgusting. They won't let them go into Mir Sharim. But the thing is too ridiculous for words. We have to see how it is in the context. If you're living in a very tough area where people are getting knifed in England, you're going to behave in a tougher way than if you live in uh, Hampstead or Golders Green. That's how it is. You have to compare with what's going on around you. And it's terribly important that Jews learn to stick up for themselves and not apologize all the time. And Lady Cox, you know, sometimes um, one comes to talks and the subject is very important and very worthy and the speaker is very, very distinguished and yet uh, you say to yourself, do I want to be possibly depressed or maybe I'm a bit too tired? And so um, after spending nearly three hours at Ben Gurion Airport last night, uh, the pleasures of an emergency landing and getting in very late, I waited until about four or five o'clock before deciding, I think notwithstanding fatigue, this is going to be worth hearing. And that judgment was absolutely correct. Um, the subject is depressing, frankly, um, and the little beacon of lights and the oasis of comfort that we do to arrive is from hearing people like you. Um, sometimes it's beyond our comprehension how brave our non-Jewish friends are because they don't have any strict need, apart from moral imperative, to stick their heads above the parapet. And it's far worse than years ago because you run real risks, not simply a verbal insult, but frankly, even a physical uh, insult and attack. And um, it's to some extent beyond our understanding, but by God, it gets our admiration. Um, you have put your head above the parrot for many years. Um, you've given us uh, some delightful, fascinating insights in your long career, people we've heard of, but we haven't met, our own heroes, sometimes flawed heroes, but heroes mm. nonetheless. And you've done that with uh, the most extraordinary bravery and determination and guts, and I think everybody here wants to thank you. I'm sure you've been thanked many, many times, but certainly here we in Edgeware thank you for that wonderful courage which you still have. Thank you for coming to regale us with your stories, uh, and thank you for giving us such an interesting and delightful evening.